uh, we have started uh, the webinar um, and we are waiting for people to join us. Uh, and as, as uh, you join, we'll just offer you a glimpse of what's coming up uh, during this fall semester. Uh, and then uh, in, in about two minutes, we'll start the webinar, but this is a list uh, of uh, the, the events that's coming up during this uh, fall semester. Um, I'll formally start uh, our dialogue uh, in, in about a minute and a half. But if you want to mark your calendars, um, uh, these are the events. Uh, and there's a QR code uh, if you want to scan it uh, about the upcoming events and uh, to register for that. Okay, uh, we'll get started as uh, there are more people joining us, but um, uh, my name is Tansen Sen. I'm the director of the Center for Global Asia. Uh, this is uh, the first event of this academic year, uh, and it is privileged to have uh, Jairam Ramesh be part of the discussion. But uh, I wanted to uh, say that I hope your family members and, and friends are all doing well uh, during these difficult times. Um, uh, the pandemic has forced us to move online with our events, but that has been really good in some ways because we get to meet many different people who have been joining us from around the world. Uh, and I hope uh, I see that there are a number of uh, participants here who are joining again uh, since they came to our spring events. But I hope that you will stay in touch uh, with us throughout uh, this semester uh, and participate in our events. Uh, today's event uh, is about uh, a wonderful book uh, that was written in the 19th century uh, and uh, revised uh, and uh, represented to the people in a detailed examination uh, by uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh. Uh, so I'll, since some of you have just joined late, uh, uh, I just wanted to mention that Center for Global Asia uh, has been doing uh, various kinds of events uh, and the next uh, slide uh, is about uh, uh, the events that's coming up during uh, this fall semester. We have a variety of uh, talks, uh, dialogues, uh, and they pertain to different parts of Asia. For example, the next talk that we have on the 29th uh, relates to literature and South Asia in particular. Uh, and also I wanted to highlight uh, the discussion we'll have with uh, the eminent Indian historian Romila Thapar uh, on October 20th, but if you can scan the QR code, you'll find the listing of these uh, various events uh, that's going to come to you uh, during the semester, uh, and we'll be sending out emails to you since you have already registered. Uh, so let me formally uh, introduce uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh. Uh, uh, he is currently a member of the Rajya Sabha uh, uh, with the Indian Parliament. Uh, he has been a union minister between 2006 and 2014 uh, and served in different portfolios, uh, different ministries, uh, and more importantly, I think uh, his role in environment and forest uh, and during the various environmental discussions that went around the world, he was a major part of that. Uh, but as, uh, as a member of parliament, uh, we see him at two different places, either in parliament or in archives. Uh, people have complained that he spends so much time in the archives uh, that uh, they are afraid of seeing him every time. Uh, students uh, also need to go and spend time in the archives. And you see that reflected in, in his publications. These are really uh, key publications. Uh, I came to know uh, Jeram uh, in around 2005 when I think uh, Chindia was published, uh, given uh, my interest uh, in India-China. Uh, uh, Jeram was the person who coined the term Chindia and, and uh, the, the end of this discussion. We'll talk a little bit about it, although this uh, dialogue is not about India and China, but uh, we would just uh, say a few things about where uh, the relations stand. 
But since then, he has published a number of very, very important books, all based on archival research, uh, one on Indira Gandhi. Uh, the latest one before the light of Asia uh, was on, on Krishna Menon, which is again a very important book uh, about uh, the post uh, independence India and the role of this important figure. Uh, so he has been writing about uh, biographies essentially about many different people. This book, The Light of Asia, is, is the biography of a book uh, instead of a person. Uh, and uh, I should mention that I reviewed this book recently for Indian Express uh, and um, I found it really, really very, very interesting read. It's about 450 pages long. Uh, but it is full with many interesting details, uh, analysis, and, and so forth. So the, the dialogue today, um, basically, we want to talk about uh, three aspects uh, of, of the book. Uh, one is the writing part, uh, how uh, 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 Mr. Ramesh got into uh, research on this very different topic, different from what he has been doing. Uh, on the person who wrote this book, Sir Arnold, uh, 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 Edwin Arnold, um, and uh, his role in uh, writing this book uh, and, and the book itself. Uh, and we'll end a little bit with uh, the, the uh, idea of Chindia. So welcome, uh, Jaram. Uh, and uh, this will basically be a dialogue between uh, Jaram and, and I. So if it's okay with you, Jaram, so I would like to start with asking sure. you uh, about how perhaps you got into this uh, this uh, topic uh, of the Light of Asia book that was written in the 19th century. Can you give us some background? Well, Tansen, um, you know, I wrote three biographies of, uh, of political personalities, public personalities over the last four years. And uh, I wanted to do a different type of a biography this time. Uh, and so I thought to myself, why not write a biography uh, of, uh, of a poem that I had read you know, almost 50 years ago, but that had remained with me, but uh, that I knew was, was a milestone in Buddhist historiography. Now, you know, like every Indian, uh, I've been fascinated and enamored, captivated by the life of the Buddha. You know, I'm not a Buddhist or a Buddhist scholar. Uh, I'm not a scholar of Buddhism like you are, but, uh, you know, like like all ordinary Indians, like every Indian, uh, somewhere we carry something of the Buddha in us, although we may not follow the, what the Buddha preached and what the Buddha taught. Uh, so this poem, uh, Tansen, uh, published first in 1879 in English uh, and later translated uh, into 30 languages across the world, including, I discovered in the year 2015, translated into Chinese as well, right. uh, you know, which only an electronic edition is, is available and we could talk about it later. So I, I really wanted to understand why this book, why this poem uh, became such a sensation uh, and how it influenced uh, different people uh, in different parts of the world. You know, it influenced people in England, in America, in Europe, in Asia, in the subcontinent. Uh, so that's one reason why I, I thought of this book. There's a second reason, um, Tansen, uh, which is that, you know, um, uh, recently we have had this long dispute over the, the birthplace of Lord Rama, you know, the, the great mythological figure of, of Indian life, the Ayodhya dispute. Uh, and before that, for 70 years, we had a dispute over the Mahabodhi temple, uh, which is uh, so sacred for Buddhists, because this is the spot where Siddhartha became uh, Gautama, uh, Buddha. He became the enlightened one. But from 1886 to 1953, uh, there was a huge dispute and uh, agitation. Uh, and the Buddhist community was agitating for control uh, over the Mahabodhi temple, which had been controlled till then for all, almost 300 years uh, by the Shivite uh, Mahants, the Hindu priests. And Edwin Arnold is central uh, to that uh, dispute because it is his visit, uh, his poem, and subsequently his visit to Bodh Gaya uh, that you know, triggered this entire movement leading up to the establishment of the Mahabodhi society 
uh, in Calcutta and uh, you know Angarika Dharmapala, the great uh, Sri Lankan scholar monk taking up this cause. And the third reason is that I found that very many public personalities, whether it was Vivekananda, whether it was Tagore, whether it was Gandhi, whether it was Nehru, whether it was Winston Churchill, you know, uh, were all enamored of this poem. Uh, and they keep referring to this poem in their letters and in their, uh, in their correspondences. In fact, I discovered two letters from Winston Churchill uh, to Jawaharlal Nehru in 1955, uh, drawing reference to the light of Asia. And I was, I was intrigued uh, because I'm a student of Nehru, uh, you know, and uh, I fairly uh, we studied, um, you know, the archives of Nehru fairly extensively. And I was intrigued by the fact that in 1955, as he was laying down office, uh, the arch imperialist uh, Winston Churchill was writing to Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, you know, about the light of Asia. So that's the background to this book, actually. I mean, it's, but you could say that the book is born out of a fascination uh, with the life of the Buddha, uh, with trying to understand how Buddha became the figure, the iconic figure that he became all over the world. Right. Uh, and, and we'll talk about some of those issues that, that you mentioned, and they, they are quite important, uh, the Mahabodhi issue that, that uh, you point out, but also uh, the current uh, issue of Ayodhya and, and the connections between that. You mentioned that in the very beginning of the book, uh, these two aspects. Uh, one, uh, you're discovering letters from Winston Churchill uh, to Nehru, and that's part of your archival research that you do so well. Uh, but also uh, the contemporary Indian politics uh, regarding Ayodhya and how it fits into, uh, into the, the whole uh, idea about Mahabodhi society as a similar uh, site of contention um, between uh, Hindus and, and Buddhists. Uh, but uh, let's talk about this person who wrote this fascinating poem uh, and, and if uh, in people in the audience, if you have not read the poem, I think it's, a, it's something to read uh, 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 in the book that uh, Jairam has written. The poem is not there, but you can easily find the poem. Uh, Jairam has put some parts of the poems in different chapters, uh, but it is worthwhile to read the poem uh, and, and see how wonderful and interesting it is. Uh, it's essentially a biography of the Buddha uh, and it's a uh, uh, its biography of Buddha has been written in different ways by different people, but this is a really a fascinating uh, biography of the Buddha written in the 19th century by this interesting figure, Edwin uh, Arnold. So, uh, so if you can tell us, Jairam, how how did you discover him? Uh, you well, you, you know, knew uh, about the poem. Edwin Arnold is a is a is a curiously ambivalent figure. Right. Uh, he's a he's a great believer in British rule in the subcontinent. He's an unabashed apologist uh, for Victorian rule in, in India and you know in the other parts of the subcontinent. Uh, but he was also an Orientalist in the, in the true academic sense of the term. Uh, you know, he knew Sanskrit. Uh, he was principal of the Pune College, which later became the Deccan College. Uh, he stayed in India for 26 months between 1858 and 1860. Uh, and he ended up translating the Hitopadesha, uh, the Gita Govinda, uh, the Mahabharata, and most importantly, Tansen, in 1885, he translates the Bhagavad Gita into English. Uh, it's called the Song Celestial. And it is that Song Celestial, which a young 20-year-old Indian law student reads in London and becomes a great devotee of the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita then becomes the defining text uh, for this young 20 year old uh, law student for the rest of his life. Uh, this is Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi got introduced to the Bhagavad Gita through Edwin Arnold's translation, the song Celestial, which remained part of Gandhi's life, uh, you know, till his very end. So Arnold is a is a curious is a curious figure because on the one hand, uh, you know he is a polyglot. Uh, he he knows Arabic. He writes a book on the ninety nine names of Allah. Uh, he knows Turkish. He writes a book on Turkish grammar. Uh, he knows Sanskrit. He translates all these iconic 
texts of Sanskrit literature into English. He's an educationist uh, and uh, he's a journalist, of course. You know, he's an editor of the very influential Daily Telegraph. Uh, and he's, you know, forever talking about Lord Dalhousie, Curzon, uh, and the modernizing role of the British uh, in India. But on the other hand, uh, he is the great popularizer uh, of ancient uh, Indic texts. Uh, and, you know, he writes about Islam, he writes about Hinduism, he writes about uh, Buddhism. Um, he doesn't write much on Christianity, but he writes about, you know, the, these religions. And of course, uh, you know, he, his third wife, whom he marries uh, in uh, 1892, uh, when he's about 64 years old, he marries a Japanese girl uh, who is 37 years younger to him. And he becomes this great um, um, champion of Anglo-Japanese uh, relationship. And he's one of the founding fathers of the Anglo-Japanese relationship in the last decade of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. He knows Japanese as well. And towards the later part of his life, he becomes um, a, a Japan file. You know, he, he starts writing about Japan and he talks about the emergence of Japan and so on and so forth. So to me, Arnold, uh, you know, this is where I differ from my good friend Shashi Tharoor uh, and, you know, many others who have condemned British rule in India. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm more ambivalent about British rule because I believe that they were a group of scholars. They were a group of Britishers who politically were not sensitive to Indian aspirations for self-rule, but culturally uh, were totally besotted uh, with uh, the, the Indic legacy, you know, with Indian civilization. Is this, uh, is this what you mean by soft imperialist? I mean, you call yes, him see, a soft imperialist. Yeah, absolutely. I would say William Jones, Max Mueller, uh, James Princip, uh, Alexander Cunningham, Monia Monia Williams, and certainly Edwin Arnold, these were all soft imperialists. They, are, they did not believe in self-rule for India. They knew that in Britain would have to leave India at some stage, but they never, they never imagined what that date would be. However, at the same time, Princip, we owe to Princip the decipherment of the Brahmi script. We owe to William Jones uh, so much uh, in terms of translation of uh, ancient Sanskrit works. Cunningham, of course, is the founder of the Archaeological Survey of India. And Edwin Arnold, uh, in many ways, was the one man uh, who made the life of the Buddha uh, popular, took him out of academic works, took him out of um, scholarly works, uh, and brought, him, brought the life of the Buddha into the public domain. So, so these maybe, were... Uh, so maybe the word orientalist is, yeah. is a term of abuse, Tansen. Yes, uh, you're yes. an academic, and in your world, if you use the word orientalist, uh, you yeah. know, it's a, after Edward Syed, it's become a term of abuse. Yeah, I know uh, that very well, uh, Jairam, because the department I did my PhD from at UPenn was called the Department of Oriental Studies. And after uh, Said came out with his book, uh, we had to change our name of the department uh, to Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. So yes, uh, so that, that term is, is quite controversial, but, uh, but you call him soft imperialist. And, and I think um, this is an issue people may have during our Q&A session. And I should mention to the audience, so if you have uh, any questions and uh, that for Jairam or to me, there's a dialogue box uh, uh, under the Zoom uh, box. Uh, you can start writing your questions and I'll, I'll ask and moderate the Q&A with Jairam. But this issue seems to be uh, quite interesting and relevant as Jairam was pointing out. Uh, there are others like his colleague, uh, Sashi Tharoor, who has a very different uh, idea about the British rule in India, a, a absolute critique of that. So we may want to discuss that at some point. Well, let me tell you, Tansen, I don't believe that uh, Edwin Arnold sat down and said, uh, well, now I'm going to write this poem, Light of Asia, and I'm going to use it to justify Queen Victoria's uh, rule over India. I don't think he sat down and said, well, how do I justify British rule in India by translating the Bhagavad Gita? See, yeah. I, I, I am not one of those who believe 
that these scholars uh, were instruments of exploitation uh, right. or they saw their works as justification for British rule. Uh, they may be believers in British rule in India, but I think we are doing them a gross disservice uh, if we overlook their contributions. Uh, after all, uh, it was the 19th century, uh, Tansen, was the century when the Buddha was rediscovered, yes. when Ashoka was rediscovered, uh, became yes. part of the consciousness. Uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, uh, in the 19th and the, and the early 20th century. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that, uh, Jaram, because that uh, it, it, the book you have pointed out in your book as well, how it fits into these new writings on the Buddha that are coming up during this period. Uh, but uh, just going back to the author of this poem, uh, he comes to India at a very critical stage, 1857, right? Yes. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, and then there's a major event taking place at, at that time. How does that impact him, if it does at all? Because he becomes the principal of the Pune College in 57, 1857. Uh, does the happening around India affect him at all? Well, Tansen, remember, Pune was never in the mainstream of the 1857 uh, War of Independence or the mutiny, as you know, depending on your perspective. Uh, and he comes to India in December of 1857. Uh, by which time the bulk of the uh, mutiny has been quelled, uh, bulk of the war of independence, uh, you know, is, is over. Uh, and in any case, Pune is out of the mainstream. Uh, so he uh, he's not, uh, some of his classmates, some of his friends are killed. Uh, and so therefore, you know, he, you know, he expresses remorse and, and grief over it. But I think he becomes uh, principal of this college with a young 25 years old, very young. Uh, he becomes principal of the Pune College. Uh, all his interlocutors are Brahmins. Uh, he learns Sanskrit. He gets exposed to Indian Sanskrit literature through his interlocutors who all happen to be Brahmin. Uh, he introduces education in science uh, in the Pune College, uh, which till then had was education was largely in Sanskrit and, you know, um, and, and um, uh, traditional science. He introduces modern science, modern science education, uh, in in and and uh, Tansen very interestingly, deeply deeply hostile to missionary activity. Uh, you know, Pune was the center of missionary activity uh, at that time. Uh, the Scottish Presbyterian Church uh, was expanding its activities. Missionaries were uh, were were you know sort of becoming very aggressive. Uh, this was the time in which uh, it was not, uh, you know, it was not the conversion of uh, the Dalits, but these were Brahminical conversions into Christianity. There were upper castes who were being converted uh, into Christianity as well. And, and um, uh, Arnold takes a very hostile position against the missionary activity. He is very, uh, very much against, and I think this part of it has to do with his uh, you know, agnosticism. Part of it is to do with the fact that he didn't see himself part of the Anglican Church. He didn't see, he didn't, you know, he was not part of mainstream organized Christianity. He was a doubter. Uh, he right. went through Oxford uh, as, a, as, a, as a doubter. He's not an atheist, but he was a strong agnostic and certainly yeah. uh, a strong skeptic when it came to, uh, you know, uh, papacy, or organized church, organized dogma, organized creed. Um, so uh, he, um, you know, it's um, it's it's very interesting. Yeah, you know, he he meets all the people who later become uh, the founders of the Indian nationalist movement. He meets Dadabai Nauroji. He meets Firosha Mehta. He meets K T Telang. All these great names of the Indian National Congress, but. Nothing stirs him, you see. Uh, right. The political aspirations of middle class educated Indians does not stir him. What stirs him is the Mahabharata, is the Hitopadesha, uh, is the Gita Govinda, is the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, that's what really stirs him. So it's but not the it's another, another, of India, but it's the uh, cultural legacy of India. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true from his translations, but there's another thing that you point out that he does which is equally important, I think, is about education, especially he yeah. calls female education while he was a principal of, of Pune College. 
can you can you talk a little bit yeah, about I mean, his one success? of the things that he does uh, Tansen, the pune college later of course becomes the deccan college uh, a very famous institution uh, in indian uh, history uh, still is uh, but he introduces education and science because this was the era remember this was the era in which um, science was just coming on uh, on to the public consciousness uh, darwin had not yet published uh, origin of the species uh, that comes out in 1859 but charles lyell's work on geology uh, was about 15 20 years old in which he had challenged uh, the dates uh, that were being bandied around uh, based on 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 biblical scholarship uh, and there was uh, you know there were some developments in chemistry and de developments in astronomy so you know he introduces science education in the pune college uh, he uh, introduces uh, women's education he writes about women's education uh, and he begin he is beginning to talk in 1860 1859 about the fact that education is monopolized by the brahmins and that it should now be democratized uh, that you know there should be greater access uh, to education Uh, of course he doesn't stay you know he's not in india after uh, march of 1860 so he does not have chance to implement uh, you know his ideas but i would say he was very sensitive uh, for that era he was very sensitive uh, and considering the fact that his interlocutors were all brahmins uh, he was uh, he was very sensitive uh, to non brahminical access uh, to education and certainly the education of girls uh, i mean in his written body of work uh, that's what really comes out very, no, that's very that's uh, so that's i i found that in addition to his translations quite uh, important uh, contribution uh, to uh, indian history as well it's not just he is translating uh, all these uh, important texts but he is also uh, making a contribution towards education and the other thing that we pointed out earlier on on the mahabodhi society itself uh, and the mahabodhi temple so i want to talk a little bit about that uh, this is a later stage his coming back to india uh, and and then playing a role uh, in this dispute uh, that is going to take place between uh, the the uh, hindus and and the buddhists about where does this uh, temple important temple actually belong to i mean who does it belong to the buddhist or the shivaites so could you could you tell us why he got interested uh, is it because of the light of asia that he wrote his interest in buddhism because he is also doing hindu texts right it's not that he is a buddhist so how does he get involved in in the mahabodhi remember, society remember oh, remember yeah. tansen he he is in pune from 1857 to 1860 yeah. uh, he goes back to england then he does the hitopadesha the geet govinda uh, and then publishes the light of asia in 1879 the bhagavad gita translation comes out in 1885 and then in november of 1985 1885 he comes on a 100 day visit to india and ceylon uh, and he you know 7000 kilometers uh, he he traverses by rail and by by uh, road uh, and um, he you know goes from the western part of the country to the eastern part of the country uh, to panipat delhi and then of course goes to uh, hyderabad madras and colombo now one of the visits he makes is to uh, bodh gaya uh, and i think the reason why he goes to bodh gaya is because uh, the fact that in 18 you know the, his poem uh, the, uh, there is a very evocative description of uh, gautama of siddhartha in bodh gaya Uh, and what happens in bodh gaya uh, and the preachings and not only at bodh gaya but subsequently at sarnath and other places now he goes to bodh gaya in february of 1886 uh, he goes to banaras uh, he goes to he starts with panipat he goes to delhi from delhi he goes to agra from agra he goes to patna uh, from patna he comes to bodh gaya uh, and um, uh, and then of course you know he does banaras and um, and sarnath in between now what happens in bodh gaya um, uh, tansen is that he sees the mahabodhi temple uh, totally under the control of the uh, mahants the hindu priests uh, who have got control over it from the mid 17th century onwards 
uh, and uh, it's been converted into a Hindu temple. Uh, although Buddhists uh, continue to keep going to the Mahabodhi temple, uh, the, the main icon uh, is, is, um, is the Hindu icon and the main offerings uh, are by the Hindus to their ancestors. Um, but it's, this is not to say that Buddhists didn't go uh, to Bodh Gaya. But what uh, Arnold writes in his um, dispatches from Bodh Gaya is that he saw the Mahabodhi temple desecrated. He saw the Mahabodhi temple not being managed respectfully from the point of view of Buddhist uh, icons, which were lying scattered around. Uh, and he basically said that he described Bodh Gaya as the Mecca of Buddhism. Now, look at this phrase, Tansen. It is used in 1886, the Mecca of Buddhism. Now, uh, and this is where I have a problem with Arnold, because Arnold, like many Westerners, does not allow for the fact that sacred spots uh, in the subcontinent uh, are very liminal places. They are places where people of multiple faiths congregate. Uh, you have, you know, Shivites, Vaishnavites, um, Muslims, Hindus, Christians. Uh, now, the notion that Bodh Gaya was the Mecca, uh, you know, so whether the, this is itself an academic scholarly question, whether Buddhism allows for a Mecca, whether Buddha ever thought of Bodh Gaya uh, in the context of how the prophet uh, thought of the Mecca or the prophets, uh, champions and successors thought of Mecca, but he calls it the Mecca uh, and then says that this Mecca has to be rescued from the Hindus and it has to be given to the international Buddhist community from Ceylon, from Thailand, from Burma, from Japan. You know, he was very particular about Japan and Tibet. Uh, at that time, of course, you know, uh, there were references to Tibet. It was not Tibet autonomous region, but it was Tibet. We're talking of the 1880s. So he starts, and then Dharmapala uh, takes this uh, campaign forward uh, with the, when the Mahabodhi Society is formed in Calcutta. Uh, and this becomes the single point agenda that how to rescue the Mahabodhi temple uh, from the control of the Hindus uh, and bring it under the control uh, of the Buddhist community represented by the Mahabodhi Society. Now, this, of, this agitation lasts till 1953. Uh, and in 1953, uh, in a typical Indian fashion, uh, the negotiated settlement is a 50-50 solution. Uh, the Hindus lose 100% con control. The Mahabodhi temple is now going to be managed by a committee, 50% of whom are Hindus, 50% are Buddhists, and the chairman is the local district magistrate. Uh, you know, he could belong to any, he's a government official. Uh, so he is, you know, by definition, not belonging to any faith. Uh, so the management committee is 50% Hindu, 50% Buddhist. And this incidentally uh, is, the, you know, is, is what the model for managing Bodh Gaya is even today. Today, Bodh Gaya is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and although there are many Ambedkarite Buddhists who are agitating for 100% control. They are saying that if Hindus can have control over the birthplace of Lord Rama, why can't Buddhists have control uh, over the place of enlightenment uh, of Siddhartha who became Buddha at that spot? Uh, yeah, however, uh, uh, Jiram, I'm going to come back to that because of the Ayodhya Mahabodhi temple uh, uh, connection that you make uh, at the initial stage and, and today as well. Uh, and then how it plays a role in contemporary politics. But uh, I wanted to move to the poem itself uh, and, and, and the issue of Buddhism uh, uh, connected to it, right? And, and as you pointed out that it is a, a poem that is written during the time when number of other uh, books uh, are coming out on, on Buddhism. Uh, I, in, in my review of the book, I, I asked this question, uh, why the light of Asia, the, the original title of the book uh, you mentioned was uh, supposed to be gospel of Asia. Uh, but the term Asia, uh, and, and I, I wanted uh, to talk about this is because um, 
it is also the time when Asia as a term is becoming popular. And uh, Okakura, whom you mentioned, uh, was the person who invented this, this uh, idea of Asia is one. Uh, so what's, uh, okay, he, he loves India, he has spent time in India, but what is his concept of Asia? Does he think of that as a concept or he just picked Asia for the sake of a title? No, he, see, by, by the time that he wrote The Light of Asia in 1879, uh, his, um, uh, his knowledge was, uh, of Asia was Siam, which later became Thailand, uh, Ceylon, which later became Sri Lanka, uh, Burma, which later became Myanmar, and certainly China and Japan, uh, because he used a lot of Japanese and he used a lot of Chinese sources as part of his uh, research for writing the book. So his notion of Asia was, of course, the Indian subcontinent, uh, plus these, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Burma, uh, Japan, uh, and, and, and China, uh, and Tibet, of course. So I think he saw, uh, if you, uh, if he saw, he saw him as a, as an Asian, uh, as an Asian sage, as an Asian reformer, uh, as an Asian, a revolutionary and you know the who, who spread the light uh, and yeah i mean he he's he's certainly a couple of years later uh, when he was being criticized for being too oriental in his approach and he wanted to be the poet laureate in order to uh, you know in order to strengthen his credentials occidental credentials he wrote a poem called the light of the world uh, mm -hmm. and that was a biography of christ uh -huh. uh, and uh, that fell flat, uh, and you know it. It just didn't, you know, hardly, hardly had uh, any uh, impact. Uh, uh, certainly, unlike the light of Asia. Uh -huh. So it's interesting that you ask that question. For him, Buddha was the light of Asia. Uh, Christ was light of the world. Yeah. But if you look at it from the point of view of enduring value, commercial success, uh, longevity. The light of Asia has proved to be far more successful than the light of the world. And there are multiple, multiple reasons for that. I mean, the yeah. appetite for a Buddha, Buddha like figure uh, in different parts of the world in the late 19th century outstripped uh, the appetite for a Christ like figure uh, and everything else that came along with Christ the church, the papacy, the bishops, uh, you know, the commandments, and so on and so forth. So, I think, yes, I mean, he saw him as an Asian figure. He certainly saw yeah. him as, as an Asian well, figure. Um, yeah, I, I went back and read uh, his, his book again, uh, the poem again, and in the preface, he gives Buddha as part, uh, sees Buddha as part of Asia. I mean, it's an Asian heritage of Buddhism that he clearly sees, and which is quite pioneering at that time uh, that he sees Buddhist linkages, not just uh, with South Asian or Southeast Asia, but Japan, as you pointed out, Tibet uh, and China uh, together. Uh, and, and so it seems that, uh, so I, I was wondering uh, if there were any connections between Okakura coming up with this idea of Asia. And we don't know, uh, uh, can you tell us if Okakura actually read the no, light Okakura, of Asia? Okakura never met Arnold Tansen, right. but Okakura was very well aware of uh, Edwin Arnold. Uh, because Okakura goes to Bodh Gaya. Uh, he goes first with Swami Vivekananda, and then he goes on his own. Uh, and Okakura, uh, Okakura becomes active at a time when uh, Arnold is, is declining health. The last years of Arnold dies in, um, you know, in 1904. Uh, and Okakura, that's the period in which really Okakura uh, the late 19th century, the 1890s and thereafter. Now, whether Okakura met Arnold when he was in Japan uh, and whether Arnold, uh, because Arnold was seen to be an honorary Japanese after he married uh, mm -hmm. Tama Kurokawa uh, in 1893. Uh, and, you know, he was, he was seen as part of the Japanese world. Uh, so maybe Okakura may well have met him. Uh, in mm -hmm. London, uh, or he may have met him in Tokyo when, or in, uh, or in Kyoto when Arnold went to Japan uh, in 1892. Certainly, uh, Okokura was influenced by the light of Asia. 
and you could see this um, um, and uh, you could see this when Okokura went. In fact, this is the distinction uh, between Okokura and Vivekananda. Uh, when Vivekananda goes to uh, Bodh Gaya, uh, Vivekananda is moved by Bodh Gaya. He is moved by Buddha, but he sees Buddha as a Vedantin. Uh, he sees Buddha in the larger Hindu Vedantic world. Uh, Okokura is not in that, you know, and this is where Okokura and Nevedita also part company. Uh, Okokura has a different view uh, on the Buddha. Uh, they see Buddha as an independent figure. They see Buddha as a revolutionary, as a rebel who got out of the Hindu fold and preached a philosophy uh, that influenced the rest of Asia. Uh, right. So, I mean, and I, I think here we need to understand the uh, the Buddhist aspect of the poem, which is uh, which is I think very very important uh, to uh, place as you have placed in the in the nineteenth century rediscovery of Buddhism, as you put it. So those of you who, who don't know this poem, it's about five thousand three hundred lines. Uh, it's it's as uh, Jairam has pointed out, it's, it's a wonderful poem. It's written in what you call a blank verse, right? Uh, I'll ask you what a blank verse means and why uh, Arnold decided to uh, write it in a uh, uh, in, in a blank verse rather than a narrative. Uh, was he was he trying to do something uh, with, with the verse part of it uh, and and then present Buddha in a different light rather than just a narrative of his story? Was he trying to create something new? Well, um, uh, Tansen, this was the era of epic poetry. Uh, you know, this uh, Victorian era was an era of epic poetry. Uh, and uh, you know, there was something about poetry uh, that was related to empire. It was related to Britain's manifest destiny uh, in uh, different parts of the world. And uh, poets were knighted. Authors were never knighted. Uh, yes, sir, there's no Sir Charles Dickens. It's only Mr. Charles Dickens. But there is a Sir Edwin Arnold. There's a Lord Alfred Tennyson. You know, authors were not uh, uh, the prose. There was no Sir Max Muller. <laughs> no, no, no Sir Riz Davids. But there's right. a Sir Edwin Arnold. Uh, so what, what uh, the poetry was the dominant mode of expression. Uh, and uh, you won't find that today. Yeah, but certainly in the 19th century, uh, it was. And blank verse was, of course, it's very simple. It's regular meters, uh, but uh, they are, uh, in, you know, unrhymed. It's not rhyming poetry. It's unrhymed lines, but it's a regular meter. It's about 50,000 lines uh, that he, I mean, it's like Paradise Lost, uh, you know, Prometheus Unbound. I, I think those were, Sort of the models that he 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 adopted. He was, you know, he knew Greek and Latin. He was very conversant with Greek poetry, uh, so blank verse was not something that he invented. Certainly, he was following a long tradition. What he does is um, he takes all the academic work that is emerged. He takes this David's work, Samuel Beale's work, Max Muller's work. Alexander Cunningham's work, James Prince's of work. He takes all these works, uh, Bernoff's work, uh, Funoc's work in France, uh, and he takes all these, um, uh, Fussball's work, Victor Fussball's work in Denmark. You know, he takes all this academic work that is emerging on the life of the Buddha and Buddha's teachings and puts it in the form of, of poetry. He narrates the life of the Buddha uh, in the form of poetry. So I think it was unusual, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah maybe that is also or something that attracted all these people who are reading it. Yes. The fact I that think that, was, that, that yeah. really caused the popular appeal. I can tell you a very interesting episode. Um, one of the first people uh, to review uh, this uh, Light of Asia was Thomas Rhys Davids. Now, mm. Thomas Rhys Davids is a great name uh, in Buddhist scholarship. I mean, he's considered yeah. to be one of the greatest names in Pali. Uh, you know, Pali literature, Riz Davids and his wife. Uh, and now Riz Davids, who was an administrator in Ceylon and then went back to England and, and did all these great books that he wrote. Uh, he really rediscovered Pali for the world. He reviewed The Light of Asia uh, and said that it is unlikely to be a commercial success. Uh -huh. 
a few months later, his own book on Buddhism appeared. Now that book bombed, it hardly sold, except you know, to a few universities. And the light of Asia becomes this great <laughs> sensation across right. the world. So but what, that's so one, one fascinating what it, thing. What it, what it tells us, Tansen, the packaging of scholarship is as <laughs> important as scholarship. I, you know, I, I say okay. this to Amitav Ghosh because every time he writes a historical novel, it sells millions of copies. Yeah. Our it's, books it's don't sell. It's how you market, how you package it, how you present it. So yes. uh, you know, you don't go back to the light of Asia for any original reference or you know archival value. But it's just that he takes all these different sources: Chinese yeah. sources, Sanskrit sources, French sources, Pali sources. And put it all together. Yeah. No, I, mean, and, 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 I mean, there are two things that that I would like to ask you before uh, we open up uh, Q and A. One is uh, uh, combined with his uh, involvement in the Mahabodhi Temple issue and and the Light of Asia being such a popular uh, uh, book uh, of poems. Um, what would you say was his contribution to the revival of Buddhism uh, as such during this this period? Well, I think what he does, Tansin, um, uh, two things, I think Arnold's greatest contributions. One is that by focusing on the humanity of Buddha, not on the divinity, but focusing on the humanity of Buddha, he made a Buddha a popular figure. Uh, he made a Buddha, he brought Buddha into the public consciousness uh, in England, in America, in Europe, uh, and of course, in the, you know, in, in large parts of Asia as well. So one, I think, in the historiography of Buddhism, uh, you will find, you will always see in any encyclopedia of Buddhism a reference to the light of Asia, its publication in 1879, as a key moment uh, for popularizing the life of the Buddha. So I think that's the one contribution he makes. The second contribution he makes is that he, the light of Asia inspires a large number of translations uh, in India, particularly Malayalam, uh, Tamil, Marathi, Hindi, Gujarati, Bengali, uh, different languages. And this becomes the text for social transformation and social reform. Uh, of which, of course, the greatest and most distinguished figure is Dr. Ambedkar, uh, you know, in the, in the mid 50s. So what he, the, for, for Arnold, Buddha was a ethical, a cultural and a spiritual icon. But in the translation of the light of Asia, the translators made Buddha out to be a social revolutionary and a social radical. And therefore the light of Asia, Tan said, became the defining text for the anti-caste movement uh, in Kerala in the early 20th century. It became a defining text for the anti-caste movement in Madras in the early 20th century. It became a defining text for the anti-caste movement of Dharmanand Kosambi uh, and, and Dr. Ambedkar. So you see, it is the influence is in multiple ways mm. uh, by popularizing the life of the Buddha. And of course, he uh, triggered Dharmapala. Mm. Uh, and I think India owes a huge debt to Dharmapala because it is because of Dharmapala that the Mahabodhi temple issue is kept alive. It is because of Dharmapala that Sarnath, uh, you know, where the Buddha gave uh, his first sermon, Sarnath is revived uh, and restored. Uh, and uh, the Mahabodhi society actually plays a very important role in the revival of Buddhist heritage uh, yes. in the first three, four decades uh, of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, extending all the 1940s, there's lots of connections between India and China through the Mahabodhi society in Kolkata, for example. Uh, but one of the fascinating things you, you point out, and this is uh, what you are, implying now are the various networks Arnold and the light of Asia creates among different people. So it's a, it's a theosophical society, Dharmapala is one of them, but also Chulalongkorn in, in, in Thailand, 
uh, is also very much interested uh, in, in what uh, Arnold is doing. But so this networks that he creates through his own travels, but also through the light of Asia, which is fascinating. I mean, you have Ambedkar, you have Churchill, you have Nehru, you have uh, Chulalongkorn. Um, all these people are, are, are connected through this book, this, this poem, right? Absolutely. Uh, Thailand, Japan, don't forget Japan. Yeah, yeah, sure. Very, yeah. very strong connections in Japan. In fact, you know, when we talk of the World Parliament of Religions uh, in 1893, uh, that is also 9-11, but that was 9-11-1893. Now it is, it is known for Vivekananda's uh, most eloquent uh, exposition on Hinduism, but the other star uh, at Chicago that day was Dharmapala, uh, who was expounding Buddhism. Uh, and of course, the Japanese, the different uh, Japanese sects who were represented, who were talking about Buddhism. And that's what starts the Buddhist interest and the, uh, and the popularization of Buddhism uh, in America, particularly. We often yeah. tend to neglect this in India. We focus on Vivekananda and we forget Dharmapala and the, and the Japanese Buddhists. But you're absolutely right. You know, he creates these networks in Ceylon. He creates his networks in Thailand, in Burma, uh, in Japan, uh, and in different parts of Europe. Let's not forget in Europe. Yes. You have Tolstoy uh, discovering the life of the Buddha. Uh, you have uh, G a German and French translations of the light of Asia. Uh, and of course, you know, in the United States, uh, it becomes a complete rage and sensation. Uh, and indeed. in that context, Jerome, I was, I mean, when you were writing the book, you, you did contact me about the Chinese translation. And we couldn't find a Chinese translation uh, before the recent one that you mentioned in your book. So it is quite surprising, the network, uh, it doesn't seem to uh, connect to the Buddhist revival movement also taking place at the same time in China. And it's, his book doesn't seem to have made a mark on the Chinese Buddhists. So I'm still I, wondering uh, why why is that so? You know, uh, I you know I um, uh, you know I was lucky that I got a forward for this book from the Dalai Lama, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I you know I tried to find out whether the Dalai Lama had read the Light of Asia when he was a child, and he himself was had very dim memories. Uh, you know, he, he he did not remember. Uh, you know, I had to goad him a little. Uh, similarly. Uh, you know, um, there I could not find, uh, I found Japanese references, I found Thai references, I found Burmese references, uh, but I didn't find, uh, I found some Korean references, but I didn't find many Chinese references other than the 2015 uh, e-book uh, translation yeah. uh, that I discovered. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it exists in the archives somewhere yeah. in in China, so, so there, there are a number of students who are participating, Jeram. So, so those uh, who are here from NYU Shanghai and other places, uh, maybe uh, this is a research topic uh, about the light of Asia uh, and its presence or non-presence uh, in mainland China is, is a topic which is fascinating. I, I think it has to be uh, compared with the revival movements taking place in different parts of Asia and where the Chinese Buddhists actually saw this book uh, or if they actually commented, I think there's a research that needs to be done still after uh, Jeram's uh, fascinating book. But I must uh, tell you something, Tansen, that yeah. one of the sources yeah. uh, that Arnold uses for his poem uh, was the English translation of Chinese texts by yeah. Samuel Beale, which yeah. in turn had been translated from Sanskrit, but the Sanskrit was not available, but the Chinese was available. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, so this 19th century period is important because of all the translations that's taking place from Pali to English, uh, Chinese to English. Uh, and, and so that becomes, as you point out, the source for his, his poem as well. But uh, let me just uh, come to two uh, last question. One is the political uh, issue that you, you point out uh, both in your book and, and today, uh, comparing uh, the issue of Ayodhya and uh, what happened with the Mahabodhi temple number of people here uh, are from China, perhaps they don't understand the politics of, of this uh, religious sites uh, in India. So could you explain uh, the, the, the similarities and differences and why does this matter? These are two entirely different cases. One was a dispute over the birthplace of uh, a most sacred figure, mythological figure, 
which was Ayodhya, uh, on which uh, uh, reportedly a mosque was built uh, in the early part of the 16th century. Uh, and the other one, of course, was uh, control over the Mahabodhi temple in the precincts of which um, Siddhartha became the Buddha, you know, Buddha, the Buddha got enlightenment and became the Buddha. Uh, uh, so they were, they were, in the sense that they were disputes between two religious communities over control over a sacred spot. I mean, that's the parallel. Uh, the Ayodhya dispute was a dispute between the Hindus and the Muslims uh, on the birthplace control of the birthplace of Lord Rama, who is a mythological figure. Uh, and uh, the Mahabodhi dispute was uh, a manufactured dispute, no doubt. Even the Ayodhya dispute in many ways was a manufactured dispute. All disputes that we are manufactured. But um, uh, it was a dispute over control uh, over the sacred place where uh, the enlightenment happened. Now, the Mahabodhi dispute was negotiated settlement. It took almost 70 years to negotiate. Gandhi was involved, uh, Tagore was involved, Rajendra Prasad was involved, Nehru was involved, many leaders were involved. And finally, in 1953, uh, as I said, uh, the control shifted from 100% Hindu to 50% Hindu and 50% Buddhist. And incidentally, when that function took place on the 28th of May, 1953, at Bodh Gaya, verses from the light of Asia were recited. Uh, so Edwin Arnold was recalled and remembered when the Bodh Gaya temple uh, was, uh, the issue was resolved. But Ayodhya, as you know, uh, was, was a bitter dispute. It, you know, it led to violence. Uh, it led to a lot of deaths. Uh, it led to communal riots. And finally, it required a judicial intervention. It was not a politically negotiated settlement, but it was a settlement that was uh, imposed and accepted, imposed by the judiciary and accepted uh, by all parties. Uh, I, the reason why I mention this in my book uh, is I think, uh, you know, we should recognize, and I think one of the mistakes Arnold did in Bodh Gaya was not to appreciate the extent to which Bodh Gaya was sacred, not just to the Buddhists, but it was also sacred to the Hindus. The Jains also came there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so limit, that's why I said sacred spots in India, uh, there is a limitarity to sacred spots. There are many sacred spots I've been to, which are visited by Hindus and Muslims and Christians and you know, people of different faiths. Um, so uh, we have to be careful when we talk of sacred spots. I think uh, uh, they have multiple uh, people of multiple faiths, uh, you know, consider them sacred for many places, from many perspectives. So that's why I use the word liminality uh, of, yeah. of sacredness. And that's something yeah. that we should recognize in the Indian. No, no, I, I, think, I think making that uh, poem from the 19th century relevant to the contemporary politics uh, and uh, given Arnold's role in, in the Mahabodhi temple uh, itself. I think it's a fascinating connection uh, of the biography of the book to the present day political uh, situation. Uh, I think that's uh, you know, something that people should also recognize as they read your book. But I want to end with uh, uh, our conversation before we open up the floor for Q&A. And I see there are a number of people already commenting uh, on the issue of Chindia. Uh, and you wrote uh, the book uh, in 2005. Uh, this was uh, a, a term that uh, perhaps a hope that one day uh, uh, China and India could work together in different ways. Uh, and, and you try to show uh, it, it's possible. It, it happened uh, not long after the relations uh, became better. Uh, and there was a lot of hope uh, at that time in the early 2000s that China and India could together do certain things. Uh, business was picking up and, and so forth. Uh, but given the situation now uh, and, and looking back uh, at uh, your idea, your concept of Chindia, maybe you can explain that uh, in your own terms because I think uh, some people have uh, misinterpreted what you intended to say uh, in 2005 uh, and, and, and how you would uh, see the India-China relations 
now because we are at a different critical stage uh, of China-India relations? Well, you know, I had the same position in 2005, which perhaps uh, I have today that, you know, we are in competition, but competition does not uh, mean confrontation and confrontation does not mean conflict. Uh, you know, that there are areas of cooperation, there are areas of engagement, there are areas of profound differences, uh, which have to be settled uh, through discussion, through dialogue, uh, but I'm afraid, uh, Tansen, uh, even so the last, you know, 12 to 15 months, uh, there is a new normal. I mean, uh, the entire, the ambience, uh, Chindia looks a dif distant dream now, you know, uh, and we are back to an era of, uh, of mutual uh, distrust, mutual suspicion. Uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we are now in an era of hyper-nationalism, uh, on, on, on both sides. Uh, so to talk of engagement, to talk of understanding, uh, to talk of uh, cooperation may sound completely out of place and romantic now. Yes. But uh, I do feel that uh, the, the paradigm that was established uh, in December of 1988 uh, by Deng Xiaoping and uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, in Beijing that was the paradigm which defined the last three decades of engagement uh, between India and China. And that's really the only relevant, uh, that's the only meaningful uh, way to go forward. You know, uh, we recognize our differences, our political differences. We have our political systems are different. Our social systems are different. Uh, we have our, we are in competition in some areas. Uh, we have differences, we have unresolved issues, uh, all that is there, but, you know, yet uh, there is a, there is, we have to create, we have to be innovative and we have to be visionary enough to create avenues for cooperation, for understanding, for engagement. We don't have to embrace, but we can certainly engage. Right, right. I think that's... No, I, I think those 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 are issues. Uh, and those of you who have not read Chindia, uh, it's available both in English and Chinese. It was translated into Chinese, uh, and it had a huge impact. Uh, we will not get into uh, the discourse about China and India today, but since uh, Jeram had uh, coined this word, which was very very much used by many people, still being used, uh, I think. Um, I wanted to put uh, Jairam's contribution beyond uh, what we are talking about today, and especially since we are based in China, uh, to also understand what he had uh, said about China and their relations. Uh, and then I would also encourage people to look at his connections with the Chinese uh, with regard to the environmental issues. I think you came to China uh, when you were the union minister. Multiple and, times, uh, multiple yeah. times. Yeah, and, yeah. So, uh, no, and we cooperated actually very well. You know, we formed this quartet, uh, basic group Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. Uh, we cooperated very well at Copenhagen in 2009, Cancun in 2010. Um, you know, I had a great opportunity of working with Chinese officials. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh and Prime Minister Wen Bao, you know, collaborated yeah. uh, at Copenhagen. Uh, but Tansen, I mean, the paradigm has shifted now, you know, yeah. uh, the, there is, there is no new normal. It's a new abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> but on we that note, manage, <laughs> we have to manage the new abnormal. <laughs> right. That's true. Uh, so on that note, let's uh, open uh, the floor for q and I, I see Patricia Obroy uh, waiting to uh, comment and, and caution. Patricia, would you like to uh, come on the screen uh, and ask uh, uh, ask uh, uh, Jairam uh, directly your question. Is are you there? Uh, if not, uh, Patricia, yes, I, I, yeah, I, there's Patricia. I am here. I'm not sure if I'm visible. No, you're uh, not visible, Patricia. I don't think your uh, oh video my. is. Uh, yeah. uh, well, uh, I did ask uh, in a note that. Um, uh, how come or was it uh, it never seemed that uh, uh, he uh, uh, actually went native uh, in the Indian context as some famous orientalists and translators 
like Sir Richard Burton and others actually did. He went native in the Japanese context where he wore Japanese clothes and ate Japanese food and uh, lived, a, you know, uh, took that very seriously. Uh, so uh, I was just wondering uh, about that. That seems to have been uh, a very interesting uh, sort of th uh, thing to contrast him with people like Rahat Edwin Rahatsek in Bombay uh, cremated the first uh, English per or uh, European cremated in the uh, Hindu, Hindu rituals in Bombay. Um, or Sir Richard Burton, of course, who was very fond of disguises of all sorts and got up to all sorts of mischief as well within those disguises. So that was, that was one question. The other was following uh, that uh, it does seem that the Light of Asia was a, a text that uh, introduced elite Indians, not necessarily Hindus, but uh, including the Parsi elite of Bombay, to uh, actually to Buddhism uh, in a way that they could, because of their anglicized education, that they could understand. And at the same time, it, uh, his Japanese phase was very important to the same people. It was an inter-Asian connection, sort of treaty port connections. I think uh, I may be wrong. He lived in Nagoya and um, uh, his writings, in any case, his writings about uh, Japan were a major source of Indians understanding Japan in that, in that time. So th I, these were just little, little uh, observations on, uh, uh, from a slightly different perspective. Thank you, Patricia. I don't think uh, Edwin Arnold ever went native in the real sense of it. <laughs> you know, he, he remained a quintessential British establishment figure. Uh, you know, he was uh, he was a very influential journalist, a very British in every sense of the term, a very keen on becoming a sir, very keen on becoming a poet laureate. Um, but, you know, uh, extraordinarily, extraordinary figure. Uh, for 30 years, he was besotted with India. And for the last 15 years of his life, uh, got besotted with Japan. Uh, and uh, so he was, uh, you know, an intercultural figure. An early, um, he was, um, there was a book that came out in uh, India in 1915 called Eminent Orientalists. This was long mm. before the word Orientalist <laughs> yes, became yes. a term of news. Uh, and uh, of, the, uh, of, of the 20 Orientalists, uh, one of them was... Um, was said with Arnold. Uh, so he was not, he didn't go native, Patricia, but he certainly immersed himself first yeah. in Indian uh, culture, uh, Indian music, Indian art, Indian architecture, and of course, Indian literature, uh, and then immersed himself in Japanese uh, culture. Now, insofar as uh, uh, the influence, yes, his English work certainly influenced elite Indians. Uh, uh, that came out in 1879, and subsequently every year it got, uh, you know, reprinted and uh, new editions came out. But Patricia, the Bengali translation came comes out in 1885. The mm -hmm. Marathi translation comes out in 1894. The mm -hmm. Telugu translation comes out in 1902. Uh, then subsequently Tamil, Malayalam, Hindi translations come. So it is true that elite. Uh, exposure to the life of the Buddha comes from the English uh, poem, but it is the translations uh, which make uh, knowledge of the Buddha much more widespread, going beyond elite circles. Of course, it, it's still dependent on literacy. It's only people who can read, uh, you know, can read these books either in English or in their translations. So I think these translations are profoundly important. To me, uh, that's why Arnold is an important figure in the Indian context. Not so much because of the English version, but because of the translations mm -hmm. that he triggers off. Uh, Jeram, I think uh, connected to that, uh, you mentioned um, his translation of the Gita uh, and uh, the impact it had on Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, one of the questions uh, is about, uh, uh, we, we also talked about the, trans, uh, the light of Asia having an impact on the revival movement of Buddhism in the 19th century and 20th century. But how about the Hindu texts, all right? Did it have an impact on the Hindu revival movement as well, other than Gandhi? 
so did the Hindus uh, also take his translation or they were happy with, uh, with the original Sanskrit form? Did they see the translation of Gita differently from, from Gandhi? Well, uh, two people make the Bhagavad Gita very, very popular Tansen uh, in the late, uh, late, very late 19th and early 20th century. One was Tilak, uh, you know, uh, the other one was Gandhi. There were others, of course, there were many other people. But in, in terms of public personalities, one was Bal Gangadhar Tilak, uh, who translated it into Marathi. Uh, and Gandhi, who came to the Bhagavad Gita via the English translation. And then, of course, subsequently, he, you know, puts it out in Gujarati as well. Uh, but yeah, but, you know, I don't think, I think... Um, the, Bhagavad, the song Celestial is certainly very important for Gandhi. Uh, and uh, till Gandhi's death in January of 1948, he's quoting from the song Celestial. He's recommending the song Celestial to his family, to his friends, to people who write to him, asking him what Hinduism is all about. He writes back to them saying, read Edwin Arnold's song Celestial. Uh, so yes, uh, there was... Um, uh, I think it's an interesting question uh, that mm. there was um, an impact of uh, Arnold's translations of the Mahabharata. Uh, but I think that came about largely through the medium of people like Vivekananda, like Tagore, uh, like Gandhi. Uh, it was uh, the Buddha impact, I think, was, uh, was, was also through his translation. That's what I mean to say. So his, his impact on Buddhism uh, was far greater than his impact on uh, a revival and rediscovery of Hinduism. I think uh, I've not touched that in my book, except uh, on, on the Gandhi and the Vivekananda front. Mm. Uh, but I would say that he's a far more crucial figure uh, in reawakening of India's Buddhist heritage than mm. in the reawakening of India's uh, Hindu heritage. Okay. Um, now, Arpita has a, has a question. Arpita, do you want to come to the screen since you have not uh, typed uh, the question? Uh, do you want to ask uh, Jeram your question? Are you there, Arpita? I don't. Uh, she has raised her ha hands, but I don't know if she wants to ask. Others can uh, type in your questions. Uh, as we wait for Orpita, but um, one of the issues, uh, Jeram, you, you mentioned in your in your book uh, so wonderfully, uh, is uh, the connections to others after Arnold uh, died. I mean, uh, so Tagore and and others uh, using the book in different ways. So there's a life to light of Asia uh, when Arnold is alive. So can you speak about uh, the the life of the light of Asia after he dies. I mean, it continues yeah, to have an impact. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's a very, very significant, uh, Thompson, because uh, long after he dies in 1904, uh, in fact, uh, one of the earliest Indian films, Indo-German film that was made in 1925, uh, in English, it was called The Light of Asia. In Hindi, it's called Prem Sanyas. And in German, it's called Der Lucht Asian. You know, uh, that was based on The Light of Asia. Uh, there were many musicals, uh, there were paintings, Abhin Abhinindranath uh, Tagore, you know, uh, if you look at Abhinindranath Tagore, Nicholas Roerich, uh, these are all, you know, the light of Asia becomes uh, a very, uh, that phrase becomes very popular. Uh, and mm. whenever Buddha is mentioned, uh, he is mentioned uh, as the light of Asia. So, he, he, you know, Buddha gets popularized as the light of Asia. But, you know, I think, uh, um, Tansen, I do want to say one thing that we should always keep in mind. Uh, you know, there are, there are broadly two traditions of Buddhism in the 20th century in India. And I'm talking of the Indian context, largely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, one, one tradition is to look at Buddha as an ethical figure, as a philosophical figure, as a cultural figure, uh, as a man who propounded a completely new philosophy of, of personal morality and personal ethics. Uh, this was the view taken by Vivekananda, Vivek, uh, taken by Tagore, by Gandhi, by Nehru, and so on. 
But there's an alternative view of the Buddha. That Buddha was not a figure of contemplation. He was not a figure of meditation. Uh, Buddha does not mean navel gazing. Uh, but Buddha means social revolution. Buddha means tackling caste uh, hierarchies. Uh, Buddha means social reform. Uh, and this was the view that was taken by Narayana Guru in Kerala, uh, by Dharmanand Kosambi, uh, and by uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, most famously. And I think the reason for this, Tansen, uh, if I have a minute, let me explain. Yes, sure. uh, you see that our traditional view, we are all taught to believe that Siddhartha sought the path of renunciation because of what are called the four sights. He saw a he saw a cripple, uh, he saw an old man, he saw a corpse, and he saw a monk. Uh, you know, and because of that, he adopted the path of renunciation, which ultimately culminated in him becoming the Buddha. This is what traditional Buddhism teaches us. Uh, this is what, in fact, the light of Asia also uh, propounds. Uh, and this is, um, I think, almost all scholars and students of Buddhism will accept. However, Kosambi, drawing from original Pali sources, in 1949, first propounded the view that it was not the four sites that led Siddhartha on the path of renunciation, but it was a war between the Koliyas, uh, the clan to, uh, to which his mother belonged, and the Sakyas to which his father belonged, over the uh, use of the river Rohini, which separated the two uh, clans. Uh, and Siddhartha tried to mediate. He voted against war in the Sangha. He was ignored, uh, and he then voluntarily subjected himself to exile because he had violated the rules of the Sangha. This was the view that Kosambi propounded, and this was the view that Ambedkar propounded in his book, The Buddha and His Dhamma. So it has nothing to do with you know, uh, seeing an old man, seeing a corpse, uh, seeing a, a cripple, seeing a monk, but it has to do with hardcore material uh, factors, you know, uh, fight over common property resources, uh, the fact that the Buddha felt anguished by the fact that he was unable uh, to mediate and stop people from going to war. So, you know, it's a, I would call it, it's a, it's a sort of a Marxist interpretation. Sure, of, I mean, I'm a, you know, you know this, the later, the later part, uh, uh, connected now, with, very interesting that, you know, just, uh, just to Arnold mention on that, you know, Buddhist school. Arnold is in the traditional Buddhist school, but all the Ambedkarite Buddhists, all the uh, people who have used the light of Asia as a text uh, for caste, anti-caste movements, uh, reject that traditional interpretation and go for the interpretation of Kosambi and Ambedkar. So, I mean, these are two very separate traditions in 20th century Indian Buddhism. No, no, I, I think that's uh, important because there's also an explanation, a counter explanation about the decline of Buddhism uh, later on, which relates to the conflict between the Hindus and Buddhists uh, yes. and, and how that perhaps uh, had uh, resulted in the decline of some Buddhist sites as well. So I think that this use or, or the presence of violence uh, in Buddhism, not invoking violence, but the, the, the issue of violence uh, in different ways uh, in the development of Buddhism and later on the decline of Buddhism, uh, I think needs to be studied as well, it should not be neglected. Uh, I think that's an important thing that you point out, Kosambi's uh, uh, alternate to why uh, uh, Buddha left, uh, renounced the society. Um, the one, uh, Arpita, are you, are you there? Um, uh, if not, then there's another question uh, that seems to be uh, connected to this, this issue. Arpita, can you speak up? I think she can't. So one of the chapters, and this is a question that uh, shows up in the chat box. Um, uh, it's about, and, and you have a chapter on this, uh, uh, Jairam, about the criticism of the light of Asia, where uh, the question is, where there are people criticizing the light of Asia? Uh, and uh, you can talk about it, what you put in your chapter about the criticism it received. Well, the criticism came from Christian missionaries. Uh, 
from largely Christian missionaries in America who were concerned that Buddhism was becoming very popular and Buddha was becoming a cult-like figure in the late 19th century. So it's very interesting that it was actually uh, the church in America, the missionaries in America, who reacted very strongly uh, to the light of Asia because they were very worried uh, by the popularity of the light of Asia. And subsequently, that was taken up by missionaries in India as well. Uh, so the attacks on the light of Asia were largely from the Christian establishment, from the church establishment. Uh, and uh, I think uh, to compensate for that criticism or to deal with that criticism, perhaps uh, Edwin Arnold decided to write The Light of the World, which I said, you know, came yes. out in 1891. Uh, and, you know, it just simply sank without a trace. It had virtually no impact whatsoever. Uh, so, so overwhelming uh, was the impact of the light of Asia. So, of course, there's a second round of criticism, uh, Tansen, that, um, you know, uh, and this, I talked to Richard Gombrich, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in touch with uh, Dr. Gombrich. Uh, and Dr. Gombrich said, you know, he read The Light of Asia when he was very young. Uh, but uh, uh, today, nobody would read The Light of Asia if you're wanting to get into Buddhism, wanting to understand Buddhism, uh, you know, you won't read it. I mean, this is a completely different situation today. Uh, I mean, you read it if you have an interest in things literally, but if you're interested only in the tenets of Buddhism, uh, if you want to know who the Buddha was, uh, there are different books. You probably will read Tan Sen Sen. You won't read <laughs> it. You know, so, uh, uh, so I think to that extent, uh, the other criticism is that it's not histor historically accurate that he he plays uh, he plays fast and loose with the facts. Uh, but you know, in his defense, I would argue that this is not an academic piece of work. Uh, you know, it's a popular it's a popular account. You know, he's he's popularizing uh, academic research. He's uh, popularizing uh, and he's giving his own, own interpretation, no doubt. Uh, you know, for example, uh, one of the great things he does, uh, Tansen, on Nirvana, mm -hmm. in the in in the last book, in book eight of the Light of Asia, the last of the eight books which comprise the Light of Asia, or fifty thousand verses, he talks of Nirvana, and there was a lot of criticism when the poem came out because remember, in, in the Nirvana was seen to be a nihilistic, negative, life denying, uh, you know, concept. And here is this poem that comes out and talks of Nirvana in a completely different light uh, and, and, and giving the interpretation of Nirvana virtually as you can be in the world, but not of the world. And that is what Nirvana is all about. Uh, yeah. So he was criticized for that. He was criticized for, you know, for not having adequate proof. But, you know, when you write a 50,000 line poem, you're hardly, uh, you're not going to give footnotes. You know, this is not an academic piece of work that's going to be reviewed in some journal, you know, writing it uh, for, for, for a completely lay audience. So, so he, was, he was criticized on this Nirvana thing, for example, he was criticized uh, that uh, he was going against what was the popular view of, of Nirvana. But I think uh, one of the great contributions and one of the reasons why the Buddha became very popular through this poem was precisely because Edwin Arnold gave a completely different view of what Nirvana is all about. Right. No, no, I mean, the, precisely because it was a literary text rather than a historical academic text, as, as you point out, uh, it may have succeeded, right? I mean, uh, who wants to read another Rai Davis's book on, on uh, Buddha with, with various footnotes? You don't need footnotes to become popular. You need this kind of uh, literary work, right? So uh, that's what uh, he had thought about this work, right? It's a literary piece on Buddha rather than a study of Buddha. Absolutely. It's not a study of the Buddha. Uh, it's taking all the studies of the Buddha uh, and putting it in a, in a, in a poetry form. Uh, and, you know, um, he was, by the way, uh, this was the time when he was writing this poem. He was writing thundering editorials uh, on uh, Afghanistan because uh, this was the time of the second Anglo-Afghan war. Uh, in May 1979, the Treaty of Gandamak had been signed. Uh, so much of 1878 and 1879 uh, in Britain was consumed by 
discussions on the Anglo-Afghan war, uh, in which um, you know um, the editorials were written by Arnold. Uh, this was also the time of the uh, Russian-Turkish conflict, uh, where Arnold took a position in favor of Turkey uh, over Russia, and he was writing about uh, you know the Russian-Turkish conflict. And in fact, you know, I have quoted his son, who in an unpublished uh, you know, memoir of his, which I was able to access, says that my father wrote The Light of Asia to relax after writing editorials uh, <laughs> on the Turkish-Russian war uh, and the Anglo-Afghan war. You know, yeah. he wanted to divert his attention and his energies from writing editorials to writing something entirely different. And that's yeah. how, you know, he wrote about the Buddha. My sense is, um, Tansen, that when yeah. he was in Pune, uh, through his interlocutors at Pune College, he became aware of uh, uh, the Buddha. And it was at that time that the rock cut caves of the Deccan were yeah. first coming into prominence. You yeah. know, the Kaneri caves, the Salset caves, the, that area okay. uh, of, uh, of around Pune, yeah. you know, which has a very rich yes, Buddhist yes. heritage. Uh, and I, uh, I have no no conclusive smoking gun evidence, but I am hundred percent sure uh, that the naturalist and the he was he would undoubtedly have been an early visitor uh, to right. these Buddhist uh, uh, you know monuments and relics, right. and that would have you know refurbished and reestablished uh, interest in the life of the Buddha, so that when the war editorials were being written in the morning. He would write his poetry in the evening. Yeah, no, Himanshu Prabhare is not here today. She, she usually participates. We could have asked her because she has been dealing with uh, those caves uh, and the monuments uh, in that area. But there are uh, two, uh, I mean, one question that uh, is related to uh, the light of Asia and, and we'll end with uh, just two more questions. One is, uh, has anybody studied the different titles of translation? Were they always translated as the light of Asia, or did the, the, the titles appear differently in different languages, even within Indian languages? Well, the, the most common title is Buddha Charita. Mm. That is the most common title. In Bengali, it was Buddha Charita. In Telugu, it was Buddha Charitramu. Mm. So, Buddha Charita. In Hindi, it was Buddha Charita. So, Buddha Charita was one of the perhaps the most common title. Mm. And uh, the light of Asia was used in Malayalam. The light of Asia was used in Tamil. The light of Asia was used in Kannada. Uh, so there are versions of the Indian translation. Of course, the European translations are all light of Asia. Mm. Uh, the, all the uh, Thai, Khmer, Sinhalese, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, translations are all light of Asia. Mm -hmm. But in India, the translation, the most common translation as Buddha Charita. You know, the, the life of Buddha, the character of Buddha. That is the one. But in some translations, the light of Asia is used. So, so the, the maybe the final question, which is uh, not about the light of Asia, but uh, about Arnold's uh, emphasis on education, women's education. Um, just like his light of Asia, did that argument about education and, and a woman's education go anywhere after he proposed uh, when he was in Pune? Well, you know, uh, I there is a there is a section in my book where I talk about uh, Mahatma Phule, uh, you know, Jyotiba Phule, who is the first great social reformer of the of the nineteenth century, uh, and there was only one occasion in which Phule and uh, and and Arnold met. Uh, but as you know, Pule was the person who started the schools, first schools for the monks and the Mahars, uh, uh, you know, uh, and he and his wife, Samitri Bhai Pule, uh, 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 started schools for the non-Brahmins and started schools for girls as well. Now, I, Arnold writes about this. Uh, you know, he leaves a, a monograph for his successor. Uh, it's a 60-page monograph. Uh, for his successor, which later got published as a book, uh, in which he talks about, he, he advises his successor uh, to, you know, to encourage education for non-Brahmins, uh, to encourage um, education for girls. That was beginning to happen in the Bombay presidency. It was beginning to happen 
uh, ironically, ironically, it was beginning to happen thanks to missionary activity, uh, uh -huh. you know, which uh, Edwin Arnold hated with a passion. Uh, if he hated something, he loved India and Japan with a passion, but I think he hated um, missionaries with a passion. If at all, if he hated anything. But ironically, some of this uh, initial uh, investments in education uh, for the non bram although I must say, Pule uh, predated uh, the missionary uh, activities, but the missionary activities, you know, also started at that time. And this is related to the nature of conversions, uh, Dansen. Uh, the, initially, the missionaries focused on the Brahmins for conversion. And when they found that the not enough Brahmins were converting, they shifted their focus uh, to the non-Brahmin communities in the hope that they would have greater success there. Good. Uh, so, Jeram, there's, there's one question about China, India, which I don't want to bring up unless you really want to answer about where India-China relations are going. But as I emphasize, today is not about India-China. Uh, it is about uh, Arnold uh, and his book, uh, the light of Asia, maybe at some point, we'll come back and revisit your Chindia in, in a different circumstances. Uh, but uh, do you want to say anything or should well, we, we have to, As I said, we are in a new abnormal. We have to go back to new normal. <clears throat> and to, to me, at least, December 1988 uh, was, was a paradigm yes. which recognized our differences but also recognize the inevitability of engagement. Yeah. And I think we have to somehow, we have to find our way. It's going to be difficult, uh, yeah. but we have to find our way. There yeah. is no alternative to engagement. There is no alternative to finding a new equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, yeah December uh, in 1988 was, of course, when the then Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, visited China. I happened to be in Beijing at that time. Uh, but that was a very different time uh, being an Indian in China. But uh, I think uh, on, on the, the note of, of today's discussion, the light of Asia, uh, I think uh, the importance of that poem to the revival movement in, in Buddhism and the impact it had in different areas, including South Asia, is something I, I would encourage uh, uh, people who are still here uh, in this dialogue to, to read up. Uh, I think it's a fascinating book, the original one. Uh, and Jairam's own book is, is uh, an extensive study uh, of the person who wrote the poem and the poem itself. So you'll get uh, not only uh, uh, the importance of this figure, but also this poem. Uh, and one thing he does at the very end of the book that we didn't get to talk about, he tracked down his grandchildren uh, and, and, and talked to them and, and, and found out how some of them had converted to a different religion uh, as well. Uh, so that uh, the life of Arnold, after his death also continues to spread uh, as the book does. So we would like to thank uh, Jairam for this uh, very important uh, book that he has contributed. It is really great that he moved beyond politicians and their biographies and, and wrote about the biography of this excellent poem. So thank you, Jairam, uh, for spending thank some time much. with us. <laughs> and and uh, this being the first uh, event for, for us, uh, we greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much, Jairam. And thank you everybody thank for you. participating. Look forward to joining your future programs. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.